Welcome back, everybody, to a, another Sunday night live stream. Thank you for joining us. We've got a true icon and veteran of the bike industry tonight, uh, Georgina Terry. Um, and I'm sorry. I apologize. We we're a couple minutes late. I realized that uh, Georgina had already started talking, but I had not hit the go live button. So that's why we are a touch tardy. Uh, but with all that said, I want to thank our Patreon supporters for uh, keeping the lights on. And if you guys want to help support the channel, don't forget to give the video a, a thumbs up, as well as checking out our merch store. We've got some fun stickers like our, our fake uh, pseudo uh, laterally, laterally stiff, vertically compliant um, steel uh, badge or sticker that you can put on your bike, as well as some fun party pace uh, merch. But with all that said, uh, let's meet our special guest for the evening, Georgina Terry. <laughs> Yay! <Hey. laughs> so glad to be here, Russ, for the second time. It's just fantastic. De deja vu. <laughs> <laughs> that was great. I love it. So, um, for for those that may not be familiar with you, can you give us a, a quick brief history again of how you got into the bike industry? Yeah, yeah. I got into the bike industry so that I could stop working at Xerox. <laughs> basically, <laughs> yeah. I uh, you know I I was living in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, going to Carnegie Mellon University for mechanical engineering, and just bicycling and hanging out a lot at Cranix Bike Shop. If you know Pittsburgh, you know that shop for sure. And just learned a ton of stuff about bicycling from Jerry and thought, you know, the ultimate thing is not building wheels and doing all this other stuff. It's the frame itself. Mm -hmm. So I, I kind of escaped to my basement and started playing around with that aspect. Cool. Yeah. And you've got this great video on your website where you talk about the, the very first frame you built. And it was kind of a, a copy of, of a Schwinn, but you mentioned that it had all these uh, weird shortcomings. Uh, can you talk about those? Yeah, yeah. It was a cool bike. This was a Schwinn Super Latour 12.2. Schwinn had just come out with a 19 inch. Uh, I'm about 5'2 or 5'3. And so I could finally straddle this bicycle I had been craving for a long time. But when I started looking at the geometry of the bike and some of the things they'd done to it, it, it was weird. They had a 19 inch C tube on it, but it also had a 12 inch bottom bracket height. I was uh, like, whoa, <laughs> why would this bike have a 12 inch bottom bracket height? Why didn't they just lower the top tube a little bit more? And of course they couldn't because the head tube was already too short and nobody was sloping top tubes at that point. That was like mm -hmm. a no-no in design. Right. So what, what, so after that, what was, um, how did you go from that to, to starting to, to, to build and, and try to get your, your bikes into bike shops? Yeah. You know, at first I really wasn't so much interested in the bike shops. It was a case of just you know, figuring out how to turn the torch on without blowing myself up in the basement. <laughs> So I, I was mostly just starting to learn technique and building a couple of frames for myself. I had friends who wanted frames. I didn't really anticipate going anywhere with this other than just having a good time until I finally got real with my life and became a Xerox employee again. Yeah. Uh, so it, it was a slow build, I would say, to that point. Yeah, yeah. Um, so it if, if I recall you've since uh sold terry or a, a portion of the business and you're doing solely just um the the bike the custom bike uh, and, part uh, of the business yeah, right yeah 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 right i mean eventually i did start the company terry and we did a lot of bicycles we moved into saddles and apparel and all that stuff and then in 2009 i sold the company to an independent uh investor in burlington vermont she was, I think, still is really interested in the saddles and the apparel, not so much in the bicycles. They're like a different beast. And so when I left the company after staying there for three years, she said, do you want to keep building these custom bikes and keep pushing the Terry name that way? And I said, yeah, you bet. So <laughs> that's what I do now. I do custom design. I don't build anymore. All of my bikes are built by Waterford. I mean, talk about coming full circle. Where are they built? They're built in the old Schwinn Paramount factory. And so this, <laughs> this Schwinn thing just whoo, came all the way around. It's kind of crazy. But yeah. yeah, that's where I am now with this. Cool. So for with all the things that you've you've done, what's what's the thing that you're most proud of? Oh, that's a tough question. You know, I don't know. I guess I probably I don't really think about stuff like that. I and, you know, Boy, that's a tough one, Russ. <laughs> I, think, I, I think I'm glad I got the industry to recognize the fact that, that maybe women should be treated differently than men when it comes to 
not only how you design bikes, but how you market your product to women and how you treat the women's market in general. So right. that's probably, yeah, that would be it. Okay, that's good. <laughs> we'll, we'll go with that. <laughs> yeah, we'll go, that's a good one. <laughs> um, and so before we hopped on the live stream, we were talking a little bit about uh, how COVID has affected business. Um, how's it been for you? It, it's been really pretty good. At first, it, it, everything was just kind of slow. I think when people are trying to figure out what is this and how are we dealing with it. But frankly, in the last few months, it's just gone through the roof. And, and as we were discussing, I think a lot of that is because COVID made people think, wow, you know, <laughs> things that we love and get used to don't go on forever. So let's let's enjoy life while we can. And for a lot of people, that means a custom bicycle, which is fantastic. Right. Um, so when you uh, ha when you interact with new customers, do you do it via Zoom or what's your, your process these days? Yeah, sometimes we do Zoom. I just did Zoom with a, a customer out west recently. But but my process is I start with a questionnaire that's pretty detailed. And and I ask them for all kinds of information, you know, just just uh, kind of stream of consciousness stuff about how they feel about their bike and what they're looking for. And then we get into the nitty gritty of having them measure what they're riding now and send me some body dimensions. And from that, I can start to get a feel for things. I mean, this is such an iterative process. It just, it goes back and forth and back and forth. Ultimately, I get a professional bike fitter involved in, in their neck of the woods, because if I can't really see somebody, and I don't think of myself as a bicycle fitter, I am a bicycle designer. They're two very different things. Mm -hmm. uh, so I really rely on a professional fitter to bring another chunk of information into the process. And I actually include the price of that fitting and the price of the bike, because to me, it's that important. And so once we go back and forth and we iterate, and it's great because I learn a lot and the customer learns a lot too in the process, I think. And then mm -hmm. we can move on to a final design. And then Orderfer looks at and goes, what? <laughs> and then there's an iterative process with Orderford while we finish all that stuff off. <laughs> Cool. Um, so let's let's get into the, the weeds a little bit about uh, the bike geometries, especially for for shorter riders. Um, so you'll do things that most production uh, bikes won't do to fit a shorter rider. Can you talk about some of those options that you offer that you know, like a like a larger brand just won't consider? Yeah, I yeah I can. I think you know, really it's wheel size. I'm not afraid of wheel size. I don't think that any one size is a hallowed size that we have to build everything around. And I think what I'm known for are my really small bikes that have been having 24 inch front wheels and 700 C rear. Recently, and recently meaning like in about the last 10 years, I've kind of moved away from that and started using a 26 inch wheel, the ISO 559 which I never call a mountain bike 26 because people immediately are like, ah, I don't want a mountain bike. <laughs> it's but too there's slow. Some, yeah, there, there's some phenomenal tires available in the 26 inch size. I mean, Jan Heine, whom you had on your show, uh, he has just a gorgeous little tire for 26. But yeah, I'm, I totally play around with the wheel sizes to that extent. And mm -hmm. I always want the bike to really look proportional. Um, so I'm not afraid to go there and I've never had a customer say, uh, no, you got to use 700 C or this isn't going to work. You know, mm -hmm. it's, it's a matter of trust. So nothing's come back to bite me yet. I feel good about that. <laughs> and, and for a while, you know, we really did influence the industry because we had the industry using 650 C, the ISO 571 size, and then they backed off of that. And, you know, now it's all about 650 B, but that's really not quite where you want to be. Mm -hmm. um so they're kind of like eh, not quite there <laughs> so why why do you think um the the bike industry seems so set on 700c uh, as like the platonic ideal for a bike wheel size well i guess if if i was a cynic i would say it's because they want to save money you know you can <laughs> save on skews if you're not using a whole bunch of different wheel sizes and i've heard it said from people in the industry that when they were using sizes like 571, there was pushback from dealers because dealers didn't want to stock the SKU. But at the same time, the industry was loading them up with 650 and super size 700C and all this other stuff. And that didn't seem to be a problem. You know? so, so what was it really? Um, it, the industry is funny. I mean, I, you know, I, I could really go on about that for a long time. I, I think that they still haven't really 
figured out this whole women's side of it. I mean, I think Liv is probably the best example of a big company that's making a commitment to that and, and not just doing it kind of half-assed, pardon me mm -hmm. for saying that. But uh, I, I just think there's so much money to be made by not worrying about that. So why worry about it? It's much easier to say we've done a ton of, uh, of studies and we've now come to the conclusion that women's specific design really is not necessary. That you know we can play around with stem length and all this kind of stuff and we can make bikes to fit women. And I, frankly, I won't be drawn into that argument because as soon as you say, is, women, is the woman's specific design really necessary? Everybody moves to their separate corners and mm -hmm. it becomes a yes or no kind of answer. And that's not good for the consumer. I mean, the idea is we want more people to ride bikes. So if some of us think that women's specific design is legitimate, then fine, let us do our thing. If it's not, the customer is going to go somewhere else. Nobody's making her take a right. choice about women's specific design. So, yeah, it's just the industry always does that. They change course like crazy. Yeah. It's, just, <laughs> it's just the nature of the beast, I think. <laughs> uh, like I in, in her uh, email leading up to this interview, I'd, I'd, I'd posited my uh, tall people run the bike industry conspiracy theory. <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 I'm only half joking, but I feel like if you look at, you know, who, who, who reviews bikes um, at the different uh, magazines, they tend to be men, they tend to be like taller men. Um, and I, I know like when requesting a review bike on my channel, it's like a special order because I ride... Uh, you know, usually a 52, some, sometimes a, yeah. a 54 depending on the bike, but they always have a 55 and 56 in, in stock. So it's like, there's, if they're prepping that, there seems like there's like a general bias, at least in the, in, in the media part. And I don't know if that plays into, uh, again, like codifying the 700 Cs. It's, it's a perfect wheel side. <laughs> yeah. 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 You know, I hadn't really looked into that. So I'm not, I'm not sure about that to tell you the truth because for the, I deal so much with the independent bicycle dealer because I mean, that's the person who has to put my bike together and, and work with this customer. And I don't get that feeling from dealers. I really don't. Mm -hmm. I think that they just want to be good for their customers and do the right thing and sell them the right bike. And, and, and maybe we're all in a battle with the industry and nobody's getting anything done. Yeah. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it sounds like you've had better success working one-on-one than than trying to to get your bikes in in the ibds on on moss yeah yeah and you know that's hard because i mean the ibd is is just under the gun because if that ibd wants to carry a big brand name then that brand is making certain requirements how much are you going to stock how much are you going to buy and then by the time he gets done making those commitments and somebody small like me comes along there's no budget left for that and, right. you know, you're just trying to kind of come in the back door. So where we were most successful with IBDs was with the smaller kind of mom and pop shop that kind of stayed away from the big brands because they didn't want to compete with these huge bike shops. But yeah, yeah. it sells really well as a custom bike. I'll sell, I'll say that <laughs> that works well. <laughs> is there, um, is there a height in your experience or inseam length where a person's probably better served on a custom bike than, than something off the rack? No, I don't think so. I think it really depends on the customer and what they're looking for. I mean, I've built yeah. bikes for women who are you know, maybe four or five or six, that small to women who are six two. And so I think it just really comes down to the customer. And it's kind of interesting in a way, if I look at my database and look at all the heights that I built for, that database, that bell curve really kind of corresponds to the bell curve of the general population. So. Mm. Yeah, I'm known for small bikes, but most of my bikes are no more smaller than anyone else's, really, as far as the yeah. customer base goes. <laughs> Who is, uh, what, what was the height of the, the smallest customer that you built a bike for? Uh, she is, I would say, probably around 4'4". Four, four. I mean, that was a bike that ended up with, I believe we put a 20-inch wheel on that bike. Mm -hmm. She's very, very, very petite. And she still has the bike. I mean, that bike was built like 20 years ago. And she's happily riding it and enjoying it. But, you know, I mean, to me, that's the fun of a custom bike. You're solving problems all the time. And everybody's a little bit different. How are you going to, how are you going to fix it? It's kind of, yeah. kind of neat. Cool. Uh, well, we've got 150 people in the chat. Uh, if you guys are enjoying the video, give it, give uh, the video a thumbs up. And if you have questions for Georgina, uh, let us know, in, um, let us know in the comments. So I'm just going to go through the comment section real quick. 
Kate Sonic says, hey, GT. Hey. Uh, <laughs> JP, so, so happy to see Georgina Terry here as a 411 kid-sized adult. Terry Vintage Bikes changed the way I ride slash view bikes forever. I wanted to say thank you both. Hey, thank uh, you. <laughs> Thanks for taking a chance. <laughs> yeah. so here's a question here. Ben Anderson. Hi, Georgina. I'm wondering whether you'd think 650B wheels are too big for a sub five-foot person for an all-road bike. Is 26 the, the better option? Yeah, Ben, in general, if I didn't know anything else about you, just what you're telling me there, I would say, yeah, I think 650B is. Because the few times I've used 650B on a bike, I've kind of been like, oh, man, I hope we're going to make this work. <laughs> <laughs> so, I, I, because what I'm afraid is if somebody's trying to use 650B, it's not to say you can't, but something's going to get compromised along the way. And you yeah. might not want to do that. Well, let's talk about that a little bit. Like, what are some of the compromises that that – they end up happening with like a with with small smaller bikes. Yeah, well, I you know there are no compromises if you do it right. But if you're trying to build a smaller bike and say use a wheel size that's really too big, then what are you doing? You're starting to get into this problem of front center distance where you know you've got to move it out so that your foot doesn't hit the tire. So once you move it out, the bicycle is getting longer this way. Are you going to be able? To, is that smaller person going to be able to reach comfortably? My theory of bike design is that the final design should always have a ton of versatility in it. Namely, if you buy a bike from me and five years later something happens and you've got to bring the handlebars a little bit closer, I haven't done you any favors if I put a 60 millimeter stem on it and the spacers are already stacked to the heavens. You know, right. so, so I, you know, sometimes it can't be avoided. I'm not saying it doesn't happen, but the game is to keep it from happening. And, you know, there really, there are no trade-offs really with smaller wheels. I mean, a lot of people think, oh, I'll go slower. No, you know, you can get around that with gearing. It's just right. not that big a deal. <laughs> Maybe my customer with the 20-inch wheels, she may have noticed something. But for most of us, no. Yeah. Um, so you offered for a while um, what I'm going to call like a, a mullet bike. So like a, a different size wheel in the front and the, and the back. Yeah. That's what's called. That's what it's called, mountain biking. <laughs> oh, <laughs> cool. Okay, it. thank you. I learned something. <laughs> mullet bike. Maybe I'll come yeah. out with a mullet model. Okay, nice. There you go. <laughs> how? Uh, I mean, how? How did you correct for the the, the smaller front wheel? Uh, I looked at in terms of handling. You might be thinking because how is that yeah. going to change it? Uh, I I relied on a guy by the name of Bill Boston. I don't know if anybody remembers Bill Boston, a fantastic customer builder. I think out of Connecticut. And Bill Boston just thought that rake was, or trail rather, was not the right way to uh, figure out your front end geometry because it was so dependent on the wheel size. Instead, he used something called caster angle, which is the arc tangent of, I've forgotten what, the rake over the wheel radius or something like that. But his theory was that an 81 degree uh, uh, angle was absolutely perfect in terms of getting to neutral steering. So when I've designed my bikes, I always take a look at that caster angle and make sure that I'm somewhere right in that vicinity. But mm -hmm. then if you want to go back into the past and read some Scientific American articles, you'll find out that it's impossible to make a fork that will flip you when you get on a bicycle. It just can't be done. It may feel really right. awful, but <laughs> so there, there is a lot more latitude there than I think you would expect for sure. Yeah. Um, cool. Let's see if there are any other questions here. Um, someone, uh, Warren asks, is there a bike design you haven't built that you've always wanted to? Well, that's a great question, Warren. <laughs> now I'm going to have to start thinking about the answer to that. <laughs> uh, I, I think it would be fun at some point. It's not really a design, but I would like to work around with doing some, some e-bikes uh, and some of the designs I'm working with. And I've been beating Waterford up about that because there's so much more that can be done now um, mm -hmm. that couldn't be done before in terms of adding that facet to a bicycle. Uh, but, but no, I think I've done pretty much everything I kind of wanted to. I, Warren, let me be frank. I'm not a real imaginative person. I, <laughs> wish, I wish I was. I really do. I rely on other people to tell me what I should, what my dream should be, so to speak. So I, I don't have a real satisfactory answer for you. But thank you for asking me the question. Uh, I'm curious, like, have you, 
Um, I know gravel bicycling's exploded within the last couple of years. Yeah. Have you seen that in terms of the requests that you're getting for custom bikes? Or I love it. I absolutely love it. I I haven't seen a whole lot of people specifically saying they want gravel bikes, but what I have are people saying, you know, I'd like to do a little off road riding now and that kind of thing. And I I constantly say, fine, you know, I'm not going to call this a gravel bike, but this bike <laughs> can do that if you wanted to do that. I've been using the Shimano GRX group a lot lately on bicycles because it gives me just so much in the way of gearing. There's smaller crank arm lengths. It just, you know, it, I, it's, it's hard sometimes to convince people that a 25 millimeter tire is, is not still kind of, you know, the hallowed symbol of what a great bike <laughs> should be. It, if you have, again, the opportunity to put versatility in, you do with rims and you do with disc brakes and you do with a group like GRX, why wouldn't you do it? Because one of these days you may wake up and go, I do. I want to go off road. It's calling me. I'm going to go explore gravel roads. Oh, wait, <laughs> on this bike, I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, I would say to some extent, I am kind of building gravel bikes. It's interesting <laughs> that, that the gravel bike world has now discovered Nito's Randonneur drop handlebar, which has the flare like this. Right. It's been around for years. It is such a comfortable bar in terms of working on your wrist. You know, the question is, why, are, why is the industry limiting that to gravel bikes? Why would you want people with comfortable wrists to be riding road bikes too? <laughs> Just right. <like> <laughs> <laughs> um, see, let's go to the comments here. William Robinson, Hydrogena. Ah, classic. A 99 trade classic from Neighborhood Bike Works in Philly. So grateful for your contributions in cycling. Uh, I am a different writer. So let's see. Da, da, da. Yeah, cool. I think I might have emailed with you, William, possibly. It seems familiar that we talked about that bike and I hope you're enjoying it. <laughs> yeah. So wild UK girl, Hydrogena and Russ. I did not, I didn't know what a good fit felt like until I got my Georgina Terry bike. Thank you. Hey, nice. thank you. Wild UK girl. UK girl. Are you really in the UK? How cool. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So in the chat, I'd be curious how many of you, uh, how many of you folks own a uh, Georgina or a Terry bicycle? Let us know in the, the comments. And if you found it used or if you had, one custom built for you would love to know. Um, so here's a question from Patreon supporter, Steve Fuller. For riders of a smaller stature, do you also end up using custom components such as uh, crank arms to solve fit and comfort problems, or is it all done with the frame design? Uh, if I change anything really, occasionally it will be the crank arm length because you can get some custom lengths made like 160, 155, and even smaller. Uh, from speed and comfort, if they're still called speed and comfort, I'm not sure. Again, that's where the dealer who's doing the fit really is important to let me know. Uh, it, I wish I could get sometimes narrower handlebars. For a while, 360s were available, and now the industry's decided that's not necessary, which is weird because the racing side of it is going to much narrower handlebars now. Mm -hmm. Hopefully, that'll find its way into my life somewhere. <laughs> um, uh, so, so mostly the components that I'm using work pretty well, and you can certainly do a lot with frame design. One place where I wish the industry would, would get with it a little bit more is brake levers. Still have a lot of customers complaining they just can't get a good grip on the brake levers. And you know Shimano has done more and more, but still not enough. Yeah. Um, so let's see. Uh, so Wild UK, UK Girl has two of your bikes. Ah, uh, even Lovin better. Is, uh, oh, the roll-off roll hub, 650B. Oh, oh nice. Ah, I think I know who you are. <laughs> 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 I think I saw that bike once, yes, in Vermont. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> so here's a burger. Uh, I have three vintage Terries and one custom. Wow, that's great. Yeah, it's a lot cool. lots of, of your, your work in the stream. Um, let's see. So um, you talked a lot about, uh, or I've seen you talk a lot about industry re resistance. Do you think it's it's gotten better? I mean, since the 80s, I mean, from, from your perspective now, does it seem like there's more variety and people are more open-minded? I, th I think they're definitely more open-minded at the dealer level, for sure. Uh, but but in terms of the really big players, I think they still kind of have their own agenda and they're they're sticking to it. Uh, yeah, I just I, it, it, to me it's it's just 
I think for them about uh, cutting costs and, you know, doing as few SKUs as you possibly can do. I mean, certainly there are exceptions to that. Again, I point to live because they've really made the commitment to saying, yeah, well, you know, we don't think there's anything wrong with building women's bikes <laughs> <laughs> and, and we're going to keep doing it for a while. I think that's, right. that's really admirable, but, no, it just, I mean, this sounds just really crazy, but even though there are a lot more women in the bicycle industry, it still sounds like an old boys network to some extent. Mm -hmm. I, yeah. yeah, I can't identify with it too much. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, wild UK girl again. She said, yeah, that's me. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, See you in Maryland one of these days, hopefully, <laughs> if not in Vermont. <laughs> Let's see. Uh, so Karina says, I was lucky enough to find ah. some Sugino 160 millimeter road. Yeah. Uh, that's yeah. Um, cool. That's cool. Yeah, the tricky thing sometimes about getting those Sugino crank sets to work is that Shimano is so tuned into having everything be Shimano or, you know, SRAM with SRAM, whatever. I mean, for good reasons. But sometimes when you start mixing and matching, with today's components, stuff doesn't always shift the way it's supposed to shift. We ended right. up eating, like, I can't tell you how many hundreds of uh, <clears throat> crank sets at one point because somebody said, oh, this front derailleur will work. One of our manufacturers, no problem. Oh, it didn't yep. work at all. <laughs> and so I stick with the brand names. But, yes, yeah, Sagino makes some great stuff. Great yeah. stuff. Do you think there's a, do you get resistance from, from customers or do you sense resistance uh, about going to a shorter crank length than, than 172? Oh, I don't, I've never used 172, I don't think. Well, maybe once or twice. Uh, <laughs> 165 is the one that I use the most and a few 170s, again, depending on height. But no, I don't. And I think especially if that customer has had a professional fit and they have a chance to feel what the difference is between those crank arm lengths and the fit. That, that that's the sale right there. And the comfort with the fitter, you know, if you really believe that this person knows what she's talking about and she says, yep, you're going to be more efficient with this, then you, you know, you go for it. Does it change uh, gear inches or leverage or, or anything when you move to a shorter crank? Leverage would because you're pushing on a shorter arm. So certainly you're going to feel it that way. Uh, and then you might want to say, okay, if I don't have as much leverage, should I compensate with the gearing? But I've never heard of any issues like that, to tell you the truth. I mean, I think if somebody were like racing or really, really super tuned into their body, they would they would pick up on something. But right. it doesn't seem to be an issue. For the benefits it brings, it probably overrides those things. Yeah. Uh, so Beth uh, Morford asked, Terry, what's the best piece of advice you can offer for a new uh, builder like <sighs> yourself? Well... <laughs> Beth, I think it's great that you're building. That's absolutely fantastic. Kudos to you. Oh, yeah. Uh, you know, you're going to make a lot of mistakes when you do it. <laughs> you're going to go through a lot of tubing and probably a lot of materials. Just keep at it. You just it's it's a case of the more you do, the better you're going to get. And I think that that's really important. And the other piece of advice I would give you, I think, is is you got to have faith in yourself. And, you know, if you have hunches about how you want to do things and what you think is right, and then don't let anybody kind of, you know, ruin your parade for you. Just stick to your guns. When I first started building, I, I made it a point if somebody told me, oh, that's ridiculous, what are you doing? Just to cut them out of the loop immediately. <laughs> because I felt that, you know, I needed to be in a really positive environment and I wanted people around me who supported me even if it was unrealistic, <laughs> because I just, I just think that that's important. You're doing something you really want to do. Nobody's going to rain on your parade. So, you know, keep the torch going and just have a great time. <laughs> yeah. I definitely feel like that that's a bit more of a challenge now with social media because it gives like everyone, you know, the, the, the access to, to criticize you if, you know, if yeah. you're, you know, so it's kind of like a, I, I, think I look at social as like a double-edged sword. It's a great you know, democratic way to, to reach more people, but at the same time, there's so much peanut gallery. <laughs> you know? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's, you know, it's really true because when I first started designing, everything was done with phone calls or we were mailing stuff back and forth. I'm, I look at some of the stuff and go, God, how did I ever get a frame built? <laughs> that would take like forever to get the information that you needed. And, yeah. and without that, you know, just immediate back and forth, how do my customers have any 
feeling of faith with what I was doing. You know, I could have just been botching everything <laughs> kind of crazy. But but yeah, I think I guess I'm glad that I started when I did. You know, maybe if I'd come into it at the stage of the game, it might have been different. I don't know. But then I'm a really stubborn person. So I, I yeah. probably would have just kept going. <laughs> 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 uh, so yeah, Karen uh, Manigan here had one of her early custom bikes in the classic and now titanium custom and a it's a Kodo Donyana. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Karen uh, is a good friend, and we have ridden many, many miles together and had many great adventures, especially in Vermont. <laughs> Thanks, <Okay>. Karen. <laughs> Uh, Roy Drinkwater, greetings oh from gosh. Golden Play. Let you know that Janet still yeah. has her. <laughs> so, Roy, are you in Florida? That's the rumor that's on the street. I hope you're doing well. I was at the Philly Bike Expo a couple of years ago, and I thought about the time we all got together. Yeah, yeah. Janet Drinkwater it was a good friend of mine when she lived in Rochester. A lot of my friends were my first customers, I have to admit. <laughs> Thank goodness for friends. <laughs> They would take a chance. Maybe that frame would fail. Maybe it wouldn't. Who knows? <laughs> My test cases. <laughs> um, let's see. So looking looking back, would you give your younger self uh, any advice that you have now? <laughs> <laughs> No, I think my younger self should give my my current self advice to tell you the truth. I mean, because you know, just just to 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 not give a damn about anything, just to be single minded about what you want to do, and and not worry about criticism or like or things like how are we going to pay the rent next month? <laughs> you know, those realistic things that adults tend to worry about. You know, I. I I would like to go back and, and be that kind of carefree, you know, kicking the can down the street, whatever's going to happen is going to happen kind of thing. Those are great days. I, I had uh, an opportunity last week, uh, a friend of mine uh, who teaches first and second graders out in California said to me, would you, would you do a Google meetup and read a, a, a book to my first graders? <laughs> I was like, wow, I've never been asked to do that before. So I went and I read this book to them, you know, and I would hold it up to the camera and show them the pictures. And first and second graders are so cool. They were just so uninhibited, but so interested. And I thought, God, if we could only be like that all of our lives, we would just be sucking stuff in and, and thriving on all this great stuff. So yeah. I kind of try to be like that. I can't be like that completely. But I do have milk and cookies before dinner, so. Yeah. <laughs> and after dinner, too. <laughs> nice. um let's see okay so we got 187 people in the chat uh, if you guys have any specific questions about uh, you know if you're a shorter person let us know what challenges have you guys faced uh, trying to to fit on the bike and we'll have georgina uh, answer them um so in terms of like your your the custom process what's the time like now like from from filling out the the, yeah. the questionnaire to, to complete bike. Yeah, you know, that's tricky. Uh, it, sometimes this questionnaire, this iterative process I've talked about can go on for quite a while. It just depends on how many things we discover about each other and we need to get cleared up before we can move on. Uh, but typically that might take maybe three or four weeks on average to do. And then once I hand a design over to Waterford, Normally, they can build a frame. Luckily, they're not running into any shortages on their end in terms mm -hmm. of tubing. So it takes maybe five weeks, maybe six weeks. One thing, interestingly, that can sometimes hold things up is choosing a color for the bike. Because that's <laughs> such, you know, you laugh, but that's such a personal thing. And for a lot of people, they spend a lot of time thinking about it. Um, but, you know, in most cases, hopefully they're going to figure out the color. Waterford's going to keep building until they get to a point where they have to start painting. But then the real hang up these days is getting components. Right. Uh, I mean, it, I've really I've waited with some bikes. I finally got three bikes now going out to dealers. And those bikes have been respectively waiting four to five months for components. And just looking right now at when Shimano says they can deliver and all that. Uh, it's still another four or five months out. Is it going to get any better? Who knows? Right. I, right. I have, I've actually been having to do crazy things like buy at retail occasionally just to get a bike <laughs> on the road. 
I bought from Amazon last week. I mean, Amazon? <laughs> <laughs> they had seat posts. What can I say? I have to get these bikes on the road. And, and, you know, tell people all the seat posts are going to disappear in Amazon. Yeah, you're now. right. Okay, yeah. <laughs> I took them all, folks. Don't don't right. go. Don't bother. <laughs> so it's uh, you know it's catch as catch can. It really is, and and frankly, it's exposed a lot of weaknesses. I think in the bicycle industry that we're in this mess, and that some distributors haven't figured out a way to get people on waiting lists that really reflect when they got into the queue and not who is the luckiest person to quick dive onto the site. I mean, right. it's just like a free for all sometimes. It's really crazy. I hear yeah. stories of uh, inventory buyers from bike shops going to sleep at night with their iPhones beside them turned on the ringtone on. So if the text comes through in the middle of the night saying derailers are here, they can grab the phone and get the order in really fast. <laughs> <laughs> That's crazy. Yeah, totally crazy. <laughs> um, let's see. So we've uh, talked about 650B, 26 inch. Uh, what's do you have a what's the most common wheel size that you you find yourself uh, designing around for for smaller bikes? Yeah, it's the 26 inch size, the 559 size. And again, I go back to that because a lot of customers uh, who were in a situation where it was either 700C or it was 24 inch front, 700C rear. And now I found that with a lot of customers who used to drop into the 24, 700 bucket, I can use 26 and still get a good fit. And now mm -hmm. they've got equal wheel sizes, which they're happy about. And I'm also really pleased about the, the amount of tires that are available in the 26 inch size, you know, the width of the tire, the quality of the tire uh, is all good. And, and rims velocity builds all of the wheels for my bikes and they stock all of those rim sizes in a variety of their rims and they're they're terrific so nice. that's that's worked out well it's rare actually that you some to see i mean i'm doing working for two customers right now we're five eight and yeah they're going to be getting 700 c for sure but <laughs> uh you know, even up to five 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 six again and it's the reach you know trying to get to the handlebars and to get over that that hump that always seems to be an issue. When when I first started riding bikes and I was making trips to dealers, you know, to sell my wares, I um, I went into a really good bike shop. I don't think they're there anymore. They were in Ohio and they had a reputation of working a lot with competitive riders. And while I was there, the guy said, "Let me do a fit on you while you're here." You know, I said, "Okay, fine." You know, I'd never had a real fit done, so I thought. <laughs> so I got on this bike, you know, and he like rearranges it when he's done. My back is like this, you know, and I'm like all stretched out. And he goes, God, you look great. I said, There's no way I could ride this bike even around the parking lot. Yeah. You know, but that's that's what 700C used to force us into, I think. <laughs> For small great. riders like me, anyway. Uh, I couldn't even breathe, you know, let alone pedal the bike. Yeah. Um, let's see. So here's a great question from Nathan. Do you have a favorite shifter brake lever for riders with smaller hands riding drops? Is yeah. there a brand? Yeah, well, really, the best one on the market right now is Shimano Altegra. And I mean, if you can get a hold of the uh, the 10 speed Altegras, they actually made two versions of that 6700 lever, I think. And one was the 6703 or something like that it was actually a little bit downsized hmm. now that they've moved up into 11 speed they're not saying they have a downsized lever they're just promoting the fact that it's really really adjustable um there is a good bike company in the united kingdom called isla bikes uh mm -hmm. isla roundtree i don't know if you've ever you're not or if you're familiar with her good cyclocross rider and she decided there was, boy, an untapped market for really nice children's bikes, which is so true. Mm -hmm. um, she came to Portland for a while and tried to make a go of it in the U.S., but, but it didn't work. But on her website for a while, they had a fix that you could use on a Shimano Altegra brake just by replacing one little screw, which would give a lot more range to the lever. And, mm -hmm. and then it kind of suddenly disappeared. And I think there was a concern that there might have been some liability issues. But Nathan, you know, if you're an engineer or you've got a friend who is, I would get the diagrams of that Shimano Altegra and think about that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I remember uh, when we lived in Portland, uh, 
uh, Isla was still in town, and we had some friends that, that worked there. And it's a pretty, it's a pretty cool model. Um, oh, it's a great that. model, and just her whole attitude about, you know, just the sustainability of bicycles, and and not wanting to build bicycles that eventually would just get thrown away and end up in a junk pile. She wanted to recycle all the stuff. She's probably doing that in the UK, but very impressive woman. Cool to talk to. Yeah, we had some friends that worked uh, for them and they had like a buyback program because, you know, kids grow so quickly. Yeah. So, you know, it, it took away some of the financial risk if, you know, investing a, a nicer bike for for your kid. Yeah, uh, it's a shame that that didn't go over here, you know. Yeah. But it's I a different remember, kind of market, I guess, maybe. Yeah, I think something to do with tariffs. I remember when oh, my friends... Oh, that could came, be. Yeah. That was a, like a, a big thing in, in Brexit and everything. So <laughs> there's yeah. a, a lot. Ge geopolitical things that, that could have uh, came into play. <laughs> yeah, for sure. <laughs> um, let's see. So any other questions for Georgina? We've got 222 people. Yay! Uh, if you're digging the video, don't forget, wow. don't forget to give it a thumbs up. It's free and it helps the channel um, so much. Okay. Uh, so Lisa Graham here says, I toast test rode one of uh, her kids' bikes. It was super fun. I'm assuming they're talking. Isla. Yeah, great. Great. Yeah. Um, so <clears throat> let's see. I talk too fast, don't I? I'm chewing up the <laughs> clock. I'm a, I'm uh, a woman of few words who just goes, yeah. <laughs> you want more? What do you want? <laughs> so what else, I mean, what else should we, should people know about your, your design process and, and other things to, to look for as a, a shorter writer? Well, I think really, you know, as anywhere, I think what makes me unique and, and the thing that really, I, I never thought it would give me this much joy because I'm not that much of a people person, but the thing I really like about what I do is all the people I meet, which is kind of crazy because I never thought it would be like that. But, but, you know, every customer is totally different and we just, we end up, you know, on a very formal meeting. Hello, I'm so-and-so I would like to. And then after that, the next thing you know, we're like messaging back and forth and, hey, can you go on a swift ride this weekend? Uh, so it's, it's just it, once all of those kind of let's keep this formal barriers get broken, then you really get into the essence of the bicycle design because you mm -hmm. get comments or I get comments like, oh, I didn't think it was important to tell you that one leg was six inches shorter than the other. <laughs> you know, it's not that extreme, but, right. but just little things like that or. Well, my hands have always been numb. Aren't they supposed to be like that? No, they're not. We got to figure out why, and we got to make that stop happening. You know mm -hmm. that those are the kinds of things that start to come out. So even though the process gets a little bit involved, you learn a lot more. And I said to my customers that what we're doing is putting a jigsaw puzzle together. And when I first meet you, the pieces are scattered all over the place, but bit by bit, we're going to figure out how they all fit together, and then we're going to mm -hmm. come out with something that's really really good for you. There may be people who just, you know, just want to buy a bike and get it over with, but I find that most of my customers aren't like that. They really, they really like that. And, and they learn so much. I mean, maybe they didn't know about gearing in the first place, mm -hmm. just, just didn't get that whole concept or, you know, something else. And now it's a chance for them to learn and understand. And again, if the fitter's good, the fitter's going to teach them all kinds of things about bicycling in the process. So, yeah, that's a lot of it. And then, and then for me, it's like after I promise people the world, sitting down looking at Bike going, whoa, <laughs> I think I just got myself in a hot water here. How am I going to make this happen? So I'm constantly yeah. in the process of learning. And I think, I think I'm teaching Waterford things too because, you know, they, they never have gone down this route of some of the things that I want to do, like asking them on occasion to curve a tube because it just looks a little bit better, you know, mm -hmm. and then getting into the nuances of, have you ever tried to bend <laughs> a one and a quarter down tube on a tube bender? <laughs> no, but I'm sure you can figure it out. And then think of all the bikes you can sell with all these bent tubes in them. <laughs> nice. you know, and so it's, it's fun. <laughs> What's really fun too, is there, there's a lot of new technology in bicycles now, I think, especially with disc brakes. Mm -hmm. and, and certainly in the gearing, not that the technology is new, but we can do so much more with one by systems, you know, yeah. that can replace triples all of a sudden. Uh, 
And so learning that stuff, especially on the disc brake side, because there's so much available, there's so many different mounts, and if you don't do them right, they don't work, and then they're adapters, and some are hydraulic, and some are cable. Right. And, you know, it's just, oh, it's, it's a lot. And, and, and the cool things that you get into with disc, I mean, when you think about a fork that has a disc on it, that disc is putting an awful lot of stress and strain on that fork. And so you have to bolster the fork blade in order to give it more oomph so that it's not twisting, you know, and causing crazy things to happen. But once you do that, you rob the fork of some of its ability to go do all those neat right. things in the steel fork that give you a really great ride like that. Right. Um, and, and that bothers me a little bit about disc. Now, I, I'm not enough of an expert on carbon fiber to say, oh yeah, the carbon fork guys figured that out because carbon is what carbon is. They can give you a fork blade that can withstand those stresses, but at the same time can absorb road shock. But I can tell you that, that in the steel world, it's really tricky. It's really tricky. Right. And, and Do you have kind more, of what's your ratio of rim to disc, disc brake bikes? If you'd asked me that two years ago, it would have been about 85% rim, the rest disc, and it's totally the opposite now. Oh, wow. Rare okay. is the customer who wants rim brakes. Yeah. And, yeah. you know, and, and there, I mean, there are absolute pros and cons to both sides of it. There really are. So it just, I think, depends on the individual for sure. Yeah. Um, let's see. So here's a question here from Stephen Marino. Five four finds it very hard to find a road bike where the top tube isn't hitting his butt when standing at a stoplight. Um, <laughs> so, um, you know, com common problem for, for the shorter rider. Like what were, what are some design fixes? Well, for... I mean, you, for, Stephen, it'd be interesting to know that the bike you're riding is the top tube horizontal, you know, like totally level across, or does it slope? A little bit from the head tube down to the seat tube. I mean, it, it, most road bikes these days, anyway. The older bikes all had horizontal tubes. What what you're saying to me, what I'm seeing is, unless you have like super super short legs, I would say I think that the bike is too big for you, really. If if it's if it's hitting you when you're standing flat footed at a stoplight. Because, I mean, with today's sloping top tubes, that's one of the problems with sloping top tubes. It's really easy to sell someone a bike that's too big for them in terms of the reach, but because they could straddle it, they think everything's right. really cool. <laughs> but, yeah, it just, yeah, it seems to me like you definitely don't need a child's bike. You need to go to a dealer who can, you know, get you on a bike, I think, where that's not going to hit. Unless, mm -hmm. like I say, there's just, you know, something crazy going on. But that's my first take without knowing you. So uh, Beth asks, uh, will you be at Philly Bike Expo this year if it happens? <laughs> yeah, Beth, I'm. It, well, you know, they sent out uh, information to exhibitors saying, hey, come to Philly this year. So Bina Belenke, who is unbelievable at running that show, uh, is clearly planning on running it again. And I'm like uh, kind of 50-50 right now. I really want to see how this COVID thing plays out a little bit more. I mean, I've gotten the vaccinations and all that. But, you know, I'm always worried that the other shoe hasn't dropped on this situation. <laughs> so I hope I will be there because I had a blast when I was there two years ago. And I'd love to yeah. come back again. So if, yeah. if we, I do go, let's get together. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think we were there. It wasn't last year, but the year before we were there uh, as well. Um, I think you, you were on the panel. I was. That, that was 2019 because 2020 yeah. was COVID year. Yeah, it, we went in 2019. Happened. Yeah. Oh, yeah. cool. I wish yeah. I'd known. We could have met each other. Then. I know. <laughs> <laughs> I think I, I wanted to sit on, on your panel, but we, something, I don't know if we, we were doing a, a panel as well or something it happened, but it just didn't happen. Yeah. yeah. Well, this year, maybe. <laughs> that would be cool if you decide to come. Yeah. Uh, so Chris Morgan asks, any chance of revving the Terry YouTube channel up? Oh, uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, Terry should really revive the Terry YouTube channel, you know, and I, and, and hopefully somebody from my former company, Terry Precision Bicycles for Women, and that would be you, Lisa Wilkes, is here listening to this and will take that back to the powers that be. I know they've done a really good job with the blog and they're doing that kind of stuff. And, you know, again, Chris, it comes down to the fact that I'm just so bad at doing stuff like that. I hired someone to do my Instagram for me, a good friend. Um, <laughs> 
you know, she's probably listening to this going, we have to revive the YouTube channel. So maybe, Chris, it might happen. I don't know. Thank you for suggesting that, though. I appreciate it. Yeah. Uh, I did watch the f the, the four bike design mm -hmm. uh uh, geometry videos that you have on there. So if you guys are curious about um, some of uh, Georgina's thinking, there are uh, at length, they're, they're, they're pretty uh, meaty videos. Um, definitely check it out. Yeah, I think, you know, for anybody who wants to just understand basic frame geometry, regardless of what kind of bike you're getting, it's not Terry specific, it's a really good place just to learn the lingo so that when you walk into a bike shop and people are throwing around different things, you'll know what's going on. Yeah. Um, let's see. So what's, uh, there's a lot of fans of, of rim brakes in, in the comments. And if, if you were to give like the, the number one value proposition of the rim brake, <laughs> this brake, what would it be? Hey, uh, well, for, on the rim brake side of the aisle, we'll say, uh, shade tree mechanics delight in rim brakes because they are, <laughs> everything is right there. They're easy to fix. Uh, if you are out in the middle of nowhere, in the world doing your around the world trip and something happens, rim brakes might be preferable because you're much more likely to be able to service them in that situation. I think just the simplicity, they certainly save on weight. They're not as finicky uh, in terms of the maintenance that goes on. Now on the positive side for disc brakes, ah, it just opens up a wonderful world of tire width, which is great because with rim brakes, you know, you're still pretty limited unless you're going to go to cantilevers or linear pull brakes, which open things up. But some people don't really like the way those look, especially. Mm -hmm. But but disc is nice in that sense because it gets away from this issue of I'm limited on tire width. Uh, you aren't going to have any problems riding in the rain. You're going to be able to stop. Uh, you have a lot more modulation if you're going downhill at 70 miles an hour somewhere in the Alps and you want to make sure everything's really good. Um, and everybody I've talked to has said, you know, I thought disc was kind of blah, but when I got off my rim brake bike and I got onto a disc brake bike, it was like, whoa, <laughs> it just lit up the world. So, you know, it's just, it just comes down to individual choice. I think there are pros and cons on both sides. At first, I didn't yeah. like the look of, of disc brakes, but now I'm getting used to that. <laughs> <laughs> I, I have to say that I have none on my personal bikes right now because I really don't want to build yet another bicycle <laughs> just to, to put a disc brake on it. I'm not quite there yet. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, I was kind of, you know, I didn't like the the kind of black box aspect. Of yes, disc good way to put uh, it. In, in particular, like hydraulics, like, you know, most of my bike maintenance skills, I've learned at uh, a bike co-op. So it's very yeah. rudimentary, you know, it's hard to mess up a cable. Well, I mean, you can mess up a cable, but, you know, it, it seems like... The it won't likely, kill you necessarily. Well, it might. Yeah, the likelihood <laughs> of, of failure, uh, as opposed to like worrying about little tiny bubbles and, and seals, uh, it just, you know, cables seem a lot easier for my, my head to wrap around. Yeah. Um, yeah, and it, another thing is, I mean, I, I'm not hesitant to uh, repair a rim brake bike uh, on a piece of carpeting. I definitely <laughs> wouldn't do that with disc brakes. Like, oh, what am I going to yeah. do? And you know, and then some people have issues with the environmental aspects. Shimano, for instance, use as uh, mineral oil in their disc stuff, and SRAM uses uh, stuff that that is not mineral oil. Let's just put it that way. <laughs> you wouldn't want to drink it. No. Right. <laughs> Uh, so Duncan Hunter here asks, how many bikes do you own? Ah, yeah, good question. <laughs> good question. Okay, we'll talk about the number of bikes that are roadworthy and ready to go at, <laughs> at this time. Uh, two are sitting in the room behind me right now. One is in the kitchen. <laughs> oh, wait, right there. I moved it out of the kitchen and put it in the dining room. That was a little bit better. One is in the living room. Uh, two are in the bathroom, which I converted to a bicycle workshop. So if you were counting, that's the number. And down in the basement, there are probably about four or five that I've used um, for parts. <laughs> Hanger queens, as they used to call them. Nice. <laughs> Do you still have that the very first uh, bicycle that you built? I have one that was darn close to the very first one. I would say it was done within months of it. Yeah, it's down in the basement with these yeah. ugly seat stay things. Oh my God. I had to figure out how to make them nice and spelt. I didn't realize you could get little things and just drop them in, you know, I was trying to file down the end of the tube, but yeah, <laughs> it's in my basement. <laughs> uh, 
Cool. Well, I'll ask one more question. That I think I'll take us home here. Um, when you're building the smaller bike, does how does the tubing change? In terms of geometry or in uh, terms of the actual like, tube set? Yeah, in terms of the tube set, do you just use like thinner uh, thickness tubing or yeah, I see what you mean. Butt, butting I, different? You know, I think it depends really on how incredibly custom you want to go. For the most part, working with Waterford, we use a fairly standard spec, even on the smaller bikes. What may happen is that it inadvertently becomes lighter because if some of the tubes are shorter, bye bye butt when you're cutting them. And that can make them a little bit lighter. Um, but it's really pretty standard. Uh, you know, if, if I really want to go crazy with something super, super light, I can certainly do that at Waterford. But for the most part, given the price point of the bikes and the fact that they're pretty darn light as it is, we just stick with standard stuff. So that would be like 0 0.6, 0 0.8, 0 0.6, maybe 0 0.6, 0 0.9, 0 0.6, just depending on which tube and where. Yeah. And what stresses we expect it to see. Like in some bikes, some smaller bikes, maybe where the top tube is really sloped, we might use a, a, suit, a seat tube that's a little bit heavier so we can run a 26 8 seat post instead of 27 2 just to handle any stress issues that may be occurring in that area. But right. that's usually the only change. And then if you get into disc fork, that can just go, Ugh. <laughs> you have no options there. <laughs> right. <laughs> uh Cool. All right. We're, well, we're coming up to the hour. Uh, I want to thank you, uh, Georgina, again for for being on the YouTube channel. We've got 252 people in the chat. Um, before Thanks, you all <laughs> rush for the exit, uh, don't forget to give the video uh, a thumbs up. Uh, be sure to visit Georgina's website. What's the URL? It's is it Georgina? It's Georgina Terry dot com. Very dot com. Uh, so if you guys want a custom bike for yourself or your partner, um, does, doesn't have to be short. But just saying. <laughs> yep. yep. Um, well, thanks again for for sharing your story and you know your years of of bike industry knowledge. I'm sure lots of people uh, in the chat here really appreciated your time. So, um, thank you, Georgina. Thanks, Russ. I had a great time. I appreciate yeah. it. Yeah. And um, with all that said, uh, thanks everyone for watching. Uh, don't forget if you like the video, give it a thumbs up, and of course check out the merch store where we've got stickers that keep the channel going. And as always, everybody keep the supple side down.